Hi, hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, launch event of our new report on climate change and sovereign risk. My name is Uli Volz. I'm the director of the SOA Center for Sustainable Finance and um, I'm delighted you have taken the time uh, to join us today. Um, this report is the outcome of a research collaboration between the SOA Center for Sustainable Finance, the Asian Development Bank Institute in Tokyo, uh, WWF Singapore, and 427 in Berkeley. And uh, we are very grateful to Inspire uh, for supporting this research. Inspire is um, one of the stakeholders, research stakeholders of the NGFS, the uh, Central Bank and Supervisors Network for Greening the Financial System. And uh, we hope that our research uh, will feed into the discussion uh, of the NGFS and also beyond. And um, let me just tell you the game plan for this session. Uh, we'll have two hours in total. Um, we will first have uh, some welcome remarks from uh, David McCauley from WWF, uh, then uh, John Byrne from ADBI and I will present you some of the main findings from the report. Uh, we aim to keep that at around 20 minutes uh, or so, and then we will have a panel discussion with uh, wonderful speakers, which are, uh, whom I will introduce uh, later when we get there. But uh, do make sure to hang on because we have really excellent speakers with excellent insights and you don't want to miss that. Uh, but uh, let me first turn the floor to David, who is uh, Senior Vice President of WWF. And uh, in a previous life, uh, David was also uh, at the Asian Development Bank, where he um, uh, led work on climate change. David, please. Thanks very much, Ulrich. Hope you can hear me fine. Welcome, everyone. Very happy to be joining you today and to have you with us. This is a really important topic that we'll be discussing, and it's uh, close to the heart of uh, WWF's work. We were pleased to be able to contribute on the subjects of uh, natural capital and how they figure into the potential for uh, loss of value of assets and, and therefore the links to, to the sorts of risks that are, are being discussed today, but also more generally fits within the work that, that we're doing globally on, on finance and the systemic issues associated with sustainability. And I, and I think that this, is, this particular topic is interesting because it combines both the, the transition risks as well as the physical risks to economies and looks at, at those interactions as well. Often we see with uh, WWF is involved with the, um, the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, which is focused on the transition risks. We've also been engaging with groups like the uh, Coalition for Climate resilient investment, which is looking more at the physical side of things. And uh, I think that this is a really uh, important way of, of framing up these risks. And I, and I hope you all will, will uh, join in that view after you hear the presentation. So once again, welcome. And we're very pleased to have uh, joined in this important uh, piece of analysis. Back to you, Ulrich. Thank you very much, David. And uh, let me now, um, oops, let me now um, start with the presentation. So uh, I will first uh, briefly. Uh, I will first briefly talk through uh, the main transmission channels of risk that we have identified. Um, We'll then illustrate that briefly with um, examples from Southeast Asia, which is one of the most climate vulnerable regions. Uh, I will then hand over to John to present you uh, quickly the main findings from our empirical work on the effects of climate vulnerability on the cost of sovereign debt. And then I will uh, walk you through the main policy recommendations uh, 
that we set out in our report. Uh, first, let me uh, highlight the transmission channels of risks that we analyzed in quite depth in uh, the report. So we look at both uh, the impact of both physical and transition uh, risks and how they could uh, impact on public finances and sovereign risk. We identify seven risk channels. The first one is the one mentioned by David, uh, the depletion of natural capital and natural services. This is an issue in its own right, but uh, climate change is making this problem even worse. And basically, uh, the depletion of natural capital is eroding the very basis uh, of our economies. And uh, this will inadvertently also uh, feed through into public finances. The second channel we highlight is the fiscal impact of climate related disasters. Um, especially for small, vulnerable uh, developing countries, uh, this can be really a killer. Uh, so um, single events uh, can wipe out uh, large parts of the economy and uh, throw public finances into disarray. And we've, we've seen actually multiple examples of that uh, with small island states over the past. Um, but this can also be uh, very significant for larger economies uh, such as Thailand, where we saw uh, huge damage done by floods, and this had a big impact also on public finances. The third channel are the fiscal consequences of adaptation and mitigation policies. There are huge investment needs for fostering adaptation and mitigation, and uh, this, to a large degree, will have to uh, be paid by uh, the public. And uh, so, uh, there are potentially uh, big implications for uh, public finances and debt sustainability. The fourth channel that we identify is really a, a very comprehensive one, and we, we discussed that in quite some detail. Uh, there are potentially very significant macroeconomic impacts of climate change, uh, which can cause supply shocks, demand shocks, and undermine the growth potential of economies. And again, uh, this is very likely to feed into uh, public finances and um, may threaten uh, public uh, um, uh, budgets, uh, budget sustainability. The fifth channel relates to the impact of climate change on financial sector stability. We've seen done by NGFS uh, and of course also academics on this topic and there is now a wide recognition that climate related financial risks can be a material risk for uh, individual financial institutions but also for the financial system at large and uh, the financial if, if the financial system uh, is thrown into crisis this can very quickly feed into a sovereign debt crisis with um, uh, interlinkages and doom loops. Um, and uh, so this is a, a very important risk for many countries. Um, the sixth channel uh, relates to the impact of climate change on international trade and capital flows, which is an area which has not received as much attention as it should have, because that is potentially a very important uh, channel of risk for many countries, and I'll illustrate that for Southeast Asia in a moment. And then last but not least, uh, we highlight the potential threat for political stability from climate change. A rich body of research has shown that climate change and the implications of climate change can accentuate existing uh, vulnerabilities and tensions and uh, therefore trigger political instability, which then uh, could uh, also impact on sovereign risk. And I'm sorry, I'm rushing through that uh, at great pace, but um, uh, let me highlight a few of these points now with uh, examples from Southeast Asia. 
um, uh, for which we have um, a special chapter in our report um, and where we ident uh, kind of analyze each of these uh, transmission channels. And again, it, I will only uh, skim through some of the main points, but, but I hope to give you a flavor. First of all, let me emphasize again that Southeast Asia is one of the most climate vulnerable regions. Uh, we've seen a massive increase in uh, various climate related uh, weather events over the last uh, century, um, including uh, increase in droughts, extreme temperature, flooding, landslide storm and wildfires. And climate scientists tell us that uh, the occurrence and also the intensity of these events is very likely to increase. So this will have implications. Uh, we discuss in the report the exposure of the region to different climate hazards, including um, uh, um, uh, heat stress, which also has an impact on uh, wildfire risk, uh, water stress, uh, or also uh, flooding risk. And indeed, as we speak, um, the Mekong area in uh, Southeast Asia uh, is experiencing extreme rainfalls and, and uh, huge floodings and um, with fatalities and big economic impact. And, and uh, we're seeing more and more of these kind of events. Um, here is a chart that shows you the proportion of transport infrastructure in ASEAN um, exposed to climate hazards. And as you can see, um, flooding and also heat stress um, are a big risk and they uh, threaten um, large parts of the infrastructure uh, in the region and uh, there is an urgent need to make these climate proof. And uh, transport infrastructure obviously uh, is very important uh, for commerce both domestically and internationally. We look into quite some detail um, for the macroeconomic impacts of climate change on Southeast Asian countries. Um, here is a, a table from some recent estimations from Khan et al. E. on the uh, GDP per capita impacts uh, under different climate scenarios. And you can see that uh, several countries are very heavily, are likely to be very heavily impacted with significant uh, uh, losses uh, in GDP per capita, um, uh, Philippines in particular, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Thailand. And uh, so this uh, will um, uh, very uh, uh, directly, of course, impact also on public finances uh, in different ways. And, and we discussed that right in, 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 in the report, but just um, to uh, give you a, a flavor. Um, one area uh, that is uh, definitely at risk across the region is the financial sector. We can already see now that physical risk is manifesting itself as credit risk for banks. Uh, so we've uh, seen that non-performing loan problems inc have increased um, uh, due to extreme weather events. Um, we are also seeing significant um, transition risks in bank balance sheets. Uh, so, for example, stranded asset risk related to uh, coal, but also other areas. And uh, it's important to highlight that in Southeast Asia, the close links between governments, state-linked pension funds, investment companies, and the banking sector uh, create a very direct transmission channel uh, from financial sector risk to sovereign risk. Uh, so that definitely needs to be analyzed further. We also look um, into the effects of international trade. And again, this is an area where uh, Southeast Asian countries are facing significant uh, risks. Um, just to highlight a few, um, there is a supply chain risk. Southeast Asia is the region that is most integrated into regional and global trade production networks. And uh, so, uh, more than 70% of total manufacturing exports are in network trade. And uh, 
as we could see now during the COVID crisis, uh, these um, uh, trade production networks can come under strain uh, with pandemics, but also uh, through climate impacts. And um, uh, so arguably um, the, the trade production networks as they have evolved over the recent decades uh, may be adversely impacted uh, through disaster risk, um, but also other uh, climate related risks. Um, another area uh, that, that could have a big impact on uh, exports is agriculture, impacts on agriculture, uh, which accounts for a large share of economies and also exports in, in some of the countries in the region. And um, uh, we know that uh, global warming will have an impact on uh, agricultural productivity. And uh, in this region, uh, unfortunately, it will not be for the better. Um, there's also a risk to travel and tourism, which makes a large port of, uh, a part of total exports uh, in many of the countries. And uh, needless to say that uh, with uh, increased disaster risk, but also coastal flooding and so on, uh, this will have an impact on uh, uh, tourism. And again, this will be, uh, uh, could, could mean the loss of an important source of foreign exchange. And last but not least, let me emphasize the fossil fuel exports that are at risk. And Brunei Darussalam is maybe the most extreme case in Southeast Asia, or not maybe, it is the most extreme case, uh, with 84% of total exports in fossil fuels. Um, but we have also Indonesia and Myanmar with 17% uh, share of fossil fuel exports uh, in total exports. And um, if we see a transformation of the world, in, uh, world economy, a decarbonization of the world economy, this will have very direct impacts. And uh, depending on the speed at which this pro uh, pro uh, proceeds, uh, this may lead to vulnerabilities. And uh, we made some very simple uh, simulations uh, in our report where we um, looked how, how would trade balances look like uh, if fossil fuel trade were to evaporate both imports and exports. And uh, for some countries, it this would uh, uh, cause significant worsening of um, uh, trade balances. Uh, and this can uh, be an important trigger of sovereign uh, crisis. Let me hand over to John to uh, present quickly on the empirical analysis on climate vulnerability uh, on the cost of sovereign borrowing. John. Thank you, Oli. Yes. Um, so we also undertake an empirical analysis to examine the impact on sovereign bond yields due to climate risk vulnerability and climate risk resilience. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So we undertake two different approaches to um, assess this. First approach is a fixed effects panel model. So we use quarterly data over the period 2002 to 2018 with sovereign bond yields as a dependent variable and a range of domestic macroeconomic factors and global factors as controls. Um, and obviously, of course, the climate risk variables as our key variables of interest. Um, we have two climate risk variables that we look at. First one is climate risk vulnerability. This is taken from the ND gain measure. And we also look at climate risk resilience, which is taken from the FTSE Russell database. Um, second approach that we look at is, a, is based on a structural panel VAR. And this is used to examine the effect of um, shocks imposed on climate risk vulnerability and resilience on sovereign bond yields. And across both approaches, we have a large sample of 40 advanced and emerging economies, and we break the economies into different um, regional groupings, um, also according to uh, a group which is deemed highly vulnerable to climate risk. And the results, as you will see, um, are different across these groups. Um, before jumping into the empirical results, it's important to have a look at what the data tells us. So here we can essentially establish our directional priors as regards what we think the direction of the effect should be on sovereign bond yields. 
So on the horizontal axis on the left, we have our vulnerability index. This is taken from ND gain, climate risk vulnerability. And on the, on the, the right-hand side, we have our FTSE Russell re resilience index on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have the yield in, in both cases. And what we can see here quite clearly across our sample of 40 economies is that we have a, a positive relationship between vulnerability and yields. So rising climate risk vulnerability increases sovereign bond yields. And on the other chart, we can see a negative relationship with resilience. So reducing resilience increases yields. So having established our directional priors, we then move to the empirical analysis. And as I mentioned earlier, we break the analysis into um, different economy groupings. So the all, looking at the chart, the all panel is um, all 40 economies. Then we have a set of advanced economies, EME group as a whole, ASEAN group as a whole, and a group deemed to be highly uh, vulnerable to climate risk. And these are classified according to being in the highest quartile for climate risk. And um, what's plotted in this chart are the coefficients that are estimated for climate risk vulnerability, shaded blue, and climate risk resilience, shaded orange. And what we can see quite clearly is that as one moves from left to right, from EME to ASEAN to high risk, we have a much greater impact um, on sovereign bond yields from climate risk vulnerability. So this is particularly apparent for the high risk group where these economies incur a premium on their sovereign bond yield of around 270 or 280 basis points. This compares to around 155 basis points for the ASEAN group um, and, and somewhat lower for EME as a whole. Um, advanced economies, we do not find any significant result um, on bond yields coming from climate risk vulnerability and all is, something of an average across all of the economy groups. In terms of climate risk resilience, we, kind of, we find a similar effect across all of the different economy groups of less than 10 basis points. Um, but of course, the much larger effect is derived from climate risk vulnerability. I would say that also that all these regressions are controlled for the dimension of all um, are also in accordance with priors worsening current account positions, increasing yields, um, worsening growth prospects, increasing yields, um, and higher global financial market uncertainty, increasing yields, etc. So we're, we're quite confident that these um, findings are um, robust to the, to the wider macroeconomic environment. Um, finally, our, our overall approach uses a structural VAR to assess how sovereign bond yields would react to shocks imposed on climate risk vulnerability and climate risk resilience. And what we can see here in these panels and these charts in the top uh, are the results for advanced economies, the bottom is for the high risk economies. We can see here that we have a positive relationship. Um, so um, a shock to a positive shock to vulnerability leads to a positive response by sovereign bond yields and this um, effect does not disappear. So the, the result remains permanent over time. So we have some permanent effects there that are apparent from these shocks imposed on climate risk vulnerability. Um, and indeed the, the size or the magnitude of the effect is much higher for countries deemed highly, risk, highly vulnerable to uh, climate risk. So again, um, as in the case of advanced economies, the shocks don't disappear. So they remain permanent over time and they're higher in magnitude for the high risk economies. That would be the empirical analysis. Thank you very much, John. Um, let me now quickly go through the policy recommendations. We highlight five areas in which climate related financial um, risk should be addressed in a coordinated manner. First, uh, we argue that governments need to conduct comprehensive sectoral and national uh, vulnerability assessments over multiple time spans, so both short-term, medium, 
uh, sorry, short term, medium and long term um, to identify relevant climate related sovereign risks. And these should then feed into national adaptation plans. Um, a lot of countries have national adaptation plans, but they today don't look at macro financial risks that we are highlighting in this report. So we, we, we think that a systematic scenario based assessment of all the different sources of vulnerability for the macro economy, the financial system and public finances is urgently needed. And this needs to include both an analysis of physical and transition risk. And uh, we suggest that uh, such an assessment could be conducted by a dedicated national climate risk board. So um, importantly, that should include the central bank and the supervisors along with other key departments, uh, such as finance, economy, planning and agriculture. Um, we do need the expertise of uh, the central bankers and supervisors. Uh, to help the government to identify these risks and, and uh, uh, draw up appropriate national adaptation plans. The second recommendation is that financial authorities need to mainstream climate risk analysis into public financial management. So we need a, appropriate disclosure, analysis and management of climate risks to public finances. Uh, we also need to see budget processes to account for climate risk and mainstream climate relevant policies and laws. And very, very importantly, finance ministries uh, need to uh, look into their uh, public sector funding and debt management strategies and also um, use uh, debt instruments uh, with climate risk sharing features such as GDP linked bonds. Uh, or indeed bonds with uh, disaster risk clauses. And uh, very importantly, uh, based on the analysis of, of uh, risks to public finances, uh, governments need to diversify revenue streams away from high risk sectors. The third recommendation relates to uh, the core work of central banks and financial supervisors who urgently need to address climate related risks in their monetary and prudential frameworks and operations. And uh, this is very much at what the NGFS is looking at. Uh, this needs to involve mandatory disclosure of climate and other sustainability risks, uh, stress testing of financial institutions and also the financial system at large. Um, central banks and supervisors need to um, mainstream climate related financial risks into their macro and micro prudential approaches. And uh, they should also, um, of course, align their, their monetary policy frameworks accordingly. And uh, this discussion is, is uh, gaining much speed at the time, at this time. Uh, and last but not least, it's also important that supervisors reconsider the prudential treatment of sovereign exposures in financial regulation. For the time being, um, uh, sovereign bonds are mostly treated as risk-free assets, which evidently they are not. Um, and uh, the, the climate-related risks that we are highlighting in this report uh, are another re a reason why uh, they should be treated differently by uh, supervisors. Fourthly, we argue that governments and financial authorities need to uh, ramp up um, uh, financial sector policies to scale up investment in climate adaptation and also develop insurance solutions. Um, central banks, supervisors can play a really important role in supporting the development um, of uh, domestic capital markets, uh, but also fintech solutions uh, to mobilize domestic savings for um, uh, financing uh, adaptation and resilience measures. Um, there's also a big role uh, for developing insurance markets and trying to broaden insurance coverage. Uh, most climate vulnerable countries face a big insurance gap 
and uh, enhancing uh, access to insurance um, uh, can increase the resilience of households and businesses, which ultimately will also take uh, a burden off public finances. And last but not least, oops, um, we also highlight the role that international financial institutions can play in supporting climate vulnerable countries uh, in better addressing climate related sovereign risks. And um, depending on their respective strengths, institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, the regional development banks, uh, and others can uh, provide technical assistance and training, support the surveillance and risk monitoring uh, within countries, but also from outside. Um, they can provide finance for adaptation and resilience investment, uh, help develop insurance solutions, and last but not least, provide emergency lending and crisis support should this be needed. So with this, I'm coming to the end of the presentation. And um, uh, sorry, this was quite a tour de force, but um, the good news is the report is out now. Uh, so it's around 150 pages long. So for those of you uh, who, who want to dig deeper, please take a look. For those of you who have uh, not as much time, uh, you may want to look at the uh, executive summary, which is also out as a separate piece. And those who have uh, extra time may want to look at the technical background paper uh, on the empirical analysis. Uh, with this, let me conclude and move over to uh, the panel discussion. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a, a stellar lineup and um, I will invite each of the panelists to give a brief intro statement of five to seven minutes and then uh, we will have a discussion among the panel and uh, participants are all very welcome to um, add their questions or comments uh, through uh, the Q&A function. Um, let me introduce the panel. We will first, uh, first have uh, Shamshat Akhtar, who is Chair of the Board of Directors of Karandas, Pakistan. And uh, she is also uh, former governor of the Central Bank of Pakistan, also former finance minister and held various senior positions in the UN and uh, the uh, World Bank and ADB. Uh, I will then invite uh, Eko Eswe Yahen, who is the secretary general of the Insurance Development Forum and has been uh, working very hard on uh, developing insurance linked solutions for climate vulnerable developing countries. Uh, I will then uh, invite Emily Matsukurati, who is the founder and chief executive officer of 427, uh, and indeed uh, part of the team that produced this report. And then uh, we'll move over to the gents on, on this panel uh, with uh, Nick Robbins, who is professor in practice uh, for sustainable finance, the finance is missing here, sorry for that, uh, at the LSE Gransom Institute. And Nick is also the co-chair of INSPIRE. And uh, so we are uh, doubly grateful for him uh, being with us now, but also for uh, INSPIRE supporting this research. Uh, then we have Ahmed Said, who is Vice President for East Asia uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific at the Asian Development Bank. And um, so in this role, he uh, is dealing uh, very directly with the problems we have been discussing in the report. And uh, so I'm looking forward to hear how the ADB uh, is trying to address these problems and support uh, climate vulnerable countries in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. And then last but certainly not least, we have Mark Thomas, uh, who is the director of country credit risk at the World Bank. Um, and as its title suggests, he has um, very direct linkages in his work to the topic of this report. So I'm very, very happy to have him in the panel as well. Uh, with this, uh, let me uh, turn the virtual floor over to uh, Shamshat. Uh, Shamshat, it's great to have you and I look forward to your insights. Thank you, Ali. Congratulations to all the collaborators. 
and authors of um, the two pieces. Um, they're very insightful um, and the topic is very current. In fact, uh, amidst the COVID-19, um, we believe that climate risks uh, have remained elevated despite the fact that people thought that the output contraction could bring in some uh, slowdown uh, in the climate uh, uh, impacts, but it hasn't really. Most of the economies um, lag behind their um, NDCs and also SDGs. Uh, and that happened even before COVID and after pandemic decline in domestic resources and rescue packages. So people and businesses have squeezed the resource envelopes um, that is impacting the climate action as we speak. So your um, um, contribution is very valuable uh, to steer the policymakers on what is essential and what should be the focus, what are the theoretical results that are coming out from your empirical, uh, also from your empirical investigations. We do know that like the pandemic, uh, uh, greenhouse gases will not respect any boundaries. And that's what is happening um, in the Asia region at, as a whole. Um, Southeast Asia is undoubtedly known for its regional cooperation. But I think uh, with what we see in terms of the vulnerabilities, my first recommendation would be that um, sub-regions should strengthen further uh, their collaboration and cooperation in the climate action area because um, what hits you on one side hits you on the other side of the, of the same continent and of the same sub-region. Now, the good news is that some countries have already submitted uh, enhanced NDCs and strategies to reach net zero emissions by 2050 and a further 114 countries have announced that they will do so. 121 countries have committed to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Now, the interplay of rising debt distress that we see now and climate stress in highly vulnerable uh, jurisdictions, particularly the low income and emerging markets, poses undoubtedly a real threat to their um, stability at large, but more so macroeconomic stability at a time when the purses have been let loose to, to support people and businesses. The nexus between climate risk and sovereign risk is complex, significant, and penetrating. And you have covered it very effectively, so I don't need to go in too deep into uh, for, uh, to avoid repetition. It is best to deploy a comprehensive methodology for assessment of these risks and costs, which arise on one hand from the physical disruptions caused by disasters, which are substantive across the whole of Asia Pacific. When I was in UNSCAP, we used to do an annual report on the natural disasters, and I think this whole belt um, has had the worst hit. Uh, compared to the rest of the world. And the transition uh, process, which I believe has not really begun in a, in a major way as yet, but it will hit us as economy, uh, economies and industries adopt low carbon pathways or um, uh, try to tweak with the greenhouse um, gas content of the energy mix or the energy intensity of the economy. Some action has happened uh, to introduce more resource efficiency and to switch to uh, in terms of the mitigation, but um, as you have also pointed out, there's less work on adaptation. So the insights that you have offered on the interlinkages between climate change and sovereign risk and how it induces uh, macro sector and en en environmental vulnerabilities and complications is going to be very instrumental for the policy makers and those uh, trying to address this issue. As sovereign risk grows, it will have a distinct impact on fiscal and financial sector, uh, 
trade and capital flows, as you pointed out, growing climate and macroeconomic vulnerability, of course, raises the cost of sovereign borrowings, uh, which of course has ends up uh, complicating fiscal and monetary stability, while generating gyrations in financial markets with implications on spreads, which have been talked about. Um, I think you have already floated the empirical evidence, but one thing that is striking in this is as regards the climate risk resilience, the magnitude of the effect on bond yields is substantially lower than that um, of climate risk vulnerability. So you um, get the worst on the, uh, on the top, but if you have even developed resilience, the declines in the bond yields um, are very modest relative to the uh, upswing uh, in the bond yields uh, when there are uh, vulnerabilities. So I think this is um, a dilemma that has to be kept in mind that um, uh, when the, poly uh, when the uh, financing is being raised. And in that context, uh, your emphasis on the public uh, sector side is appropriate and mainstreaming um, uh, climate uh, risk and resilience within uh, the central bank uh, policy uh, frameworks is critical so that one can influence because most of Asia particularly is very bank-based uh, uh, financing system. So it would help if the central banks step in. Let me just at the end make a few, four or five points um, since a lot has been said already in your presentation. Countries in my view should focus on policy integration and institutional coordination. You've touched upon that. Central banks undoubtedly have to be the lead, but I have to say we can, central banks can't move until fiscal authorities step in in a big way because no central bank has uh, a lot of power until the ministries of finance give you uh, that power. And central banks can manage uh, the uh, financial intermediation side of which is very bulky also, but fiscal authorities have the power to step in for corrective actions also. So all critical agencies uh, need to come on the same page, develop a common strategy for climate action and risk management, and ensure it's backed by an effective sovereign risk management. And there you have these multilaterals that can step in with credit enhancement to the extent it's needed. Developing, of course, comprehensive model and using it to undertake an integrated medium and long-term scenario analysis for climate fiscal come finance will be useful. And this is some of the work that NGFS has been doing. And you have talked about national adaptation, but I also think it needs to be um, reinforced by mitigation in a bigger manner than what has been done thus far. With, of course, supporting funding mechanism, and it should be backed by, of course, robust resource flows, uh, which is quite a challenge. So today we have NGFS, Central Bankers uh, um, Coalition, but we also now have a coalition of finance ministers for climate action that are supporting the development of long-term strategic plans, investment policies, and financial incentives to create societal benefits and economic growth. It's very impressive, the principles they have. So everybody has principles. Uh, we have institutional investors with their principles. So we have different constituents that are at play. What is lacking is, of course, uh, um, uh, making sure that the, the 40 country or 40 plus countries that are in NGFS do benefit the developing countries. Not all of them. Uh, there are very few uh, countries and confined to Southeast Asia that are members of NGFS. And so is true of the coalition of the finance minister. So what would be good is if there are regional coalitions of the parallel nature that are drawing their inspiration from these uh, mega platforms, uh, because all the technical work is very good from these uh, uh, principal bodies. And I like your idea of the coordination uh, uh, within the government to set up a, a national coordination council. My, my 
um, a submission of integration is really in sync with that. The second point I'd like to leave behind is that central banks also need to integrate more carefully climate-related financial risk in their monetary policies and financial regulation and stability. <clears throat> and you've done very good work <clears throat> at SOAS for that. And we need to train more and more people in stress te testing for um, uh, identifying the climate risk as well as the mechanisms for resilience and also the whole area of developing the anatomy, which is very critical. We have to come with standard, uh, standards, harmonized standards, so that everybody is looking uh, at the same thing in assessing the assets valuation or the pricing and so on and so forth. My third point is that governments need to mainstream climate finance in budgeting and establish a fiscal fund financed by savings from fossil fuel subsidies and imposition of carbon tax, since carbon must have a price and polluters must pay for their pollution, etc., to finance green public or PPP projects pipeline that facilitates a just transition to decarbonization. The last two recommendations that I have, one is a very short one. This is the, the point that I have um, taken from the Overseas Development Institute to actually consider establishing a green development bank, no matter what you call, whether a climate development bank or whatever. I think it's very important to do so because there are limits to what the multilaterals can come forward with and the financing requirements, as you already know, are huge. Now, to conclude, we have the biggest dilemma we have that we have to really address this issue. In. We have to promote um, post-COVID green recovery, which is sustainable, which is carbon neutral, and so on and so forth. How do you do that when there is such a huge dis debt distress in a number of these countries? So having G20 step in to resolve uh, this further beyond the debt standstill and beyond the IMF support or the HIPAA support that's come forward. Because as you all probably all know, that emerging markets alone have issued 124 billion in hard currency debt during the first six months of 2020. So there are concerns if you can go to capital markets and access cheaply, given the evidence you have offered. I'll stop here and uh, let others contribute to this debate. Thank you so much, Shamshad, for, for, as always, very insightful remarks. And um, also, thank you for, for reinforcing the, the points about uh, the need for greater policy integration and coordination. And I think your, your point about the relevance, the role of finance ministers really uh, well taken. In, in fact, it, this meeting or this event, uh, the coalition of finance, min uh, the coalition of finance ministers for climate action, um, just had a meeting, and uh, I hope they they will also take note of, of the messages that we uh, are sending. Um, let me now uh, ask uh, Ikwesi to give her comments, and um, really great to see you. Okay, thank you very much, Uli, and and really thanks for the invitation to be part of this meeting. Um, I think that you have, you have really led and the team that worked on this have really done an excellent job and also for the interventions from Samshad earlier um, in really highlighting the complexity of, of the problem and driving home the challenges that we face. But I think importantly also offering um, some recommendations. Um, from my perspective, I think when I, when I reviewed the report, obviously it really drove home some very important points, which is yes, we're dealing with these big macro issues, but ultimately we're also talking about impacts on individuals, impacts on households um, who are already very strained, um, really going through trying times and we have an urgent situation and how do we begin to mobilize ourselves to be more urgent and deliberate in driving solutions. So I just wanted to say congratulations to you and the institutions that were involved in producing this report. I think it is timely 
um, and really invaluable and really a great stop shop for people who are really concerned about this theme and what we can do. Um, so the IDF itself as the Insurance Development Forum we really welcomed um, the report. It's actually very much aligned with a lot of the thinking that has been taking place within the IDF and our membership. Um, this being not only the insurance industry members, but also the public sector members within um, the IDF. And I will perhaps, um, again, to avoid repetition, because I think that the interventions and the presentations earlier were really quite excellent in terms of articulating the issues, but perhaps just focus on some of the recommendations and provide some reflections. And in particular, recommendations one, two, four, and five. Uh, so for me, the first recommendation, which was about um, conducting a comprehensive vulnerability assessment and developing a national adaptation plan is actually quite critical. Um, I think that sometimes um, there isn't enough of an understanding about the fact that we need to deepen the level of understanding in many of our countries, um, in the Asia region, but right across the world in terms of risk information. Um, the ability to understand, to, to generate data to support better risk understanding and ultimately the development of the kinds of solutions that are needed. And so for us, this recommendation was really quite critical because obviously the insurance industry itself is built on principles of understanding risk. Um, and so this is for the IDF an important area of, 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 of activity for us in terms of how we engage governments, how we engage public sector institutions around this. Um, I also welcome the recommendation of the establishment of a dedicated unit that would be responsible within governments of really looking at climate risk and how do we begin to mainstream this issue. Um, I remember when I was working in, in the Caribbean in the in early 2000s, 1990s, etc., that this was an issue I remember some of the insurance companies were already engaging with governments around um, having a country, a, a climate risk officer. Um, who could begin to engage with government officials, the different ministries, looking at national budgeting practices to see how we were actually dealing with this issue of climate risk. And so that for me was actually quite critical. Again, the issue of national adaptation plans, really, as you mentioned, many governments have national adaptation plans already, but the question is how do you finance this? What are the trade-offs that need to be made given the constraints that we are faced in terms of actually um, mobilizing resources to invest in the kind of adaptation um, investments that are needed. Um, and this is where you really do need greater collaboration, greater innovation in terms of mobilizing of resources with the private sector, um, with different communities to help to, to address this um, issue. Uh, the second is obviously, the second recommendation was obviously one that I thought was again critical on climate risk analysis and mainstreaming that in public financial management. Uh, there was a chapter which focused on the issue of contingent liabilities and what does that mean when we talk about when you have, as an example, a disaster occurring um, and the strain that it puts on, on governments and the expectations that citizens also have for governments to intervene and provide responses. Um, and so for us, this is actually quite an important one because it's also an opportunity um, not only to address the first recommendation in terms of mainstreaming better understanding of uh, climate risk and how we deal with it, but how, we, how do we improve government public, public financial management practices? Um, I believe that the insurance industry has a lot that it can offer to this process. Um, and there are also lots of things that I think that the private sector can learn in terms of how governments operate and the constraints that they find to begin to find um, some convergence. Um, the report for me highlighted a number of, I think, really critical um, points for inflection. Uh, one of the things that really stood out for me, and I think that many of us are quite uh, familiar with this, is the fact that in the region, um, based on, on the data in the report in 2018, non-life insurance premiums accounted for only 1% of GDP, less than a third of the global average. This is quite significant when we think about when governments are affected by these disasters, how are they mobilizing the resources? Um, you know, what are the alternative streams of financing to actually respond to households? How resilient are households to independently finance their recovery efforts? Um, and so for us, um, really having an opportunity to work with governments or to strengthen the capacity of governments and public financial management systems in looking at climate risk and different kinds of tools and options um, really is an important one. The third recommendation or the fourth recommendation I would say was also one that um, 
obviously is really at the heart of what we are trying to do within the IEDF, which is, as you had identified in the report, implement financial sector policies to scale up investments in climate adaptation and resilience and develop insurance solutions. Um, and again, related to the points, to the data point that I shared earlier in terms of the 1% of GDP when we talk about um, non-life insurance premium, is this idea of the um, protection gap. And the protection gap really being um, the difference between the kinds of economic losses that we're seeing and the, 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 the extent of those losses um, that are insured. And every year, um, the insurance companies within the IDF do an analysis, the big market players of where do we stand as it relates to the, the protection gap. And the report released by Aon last year, 20, earlier this year in 2020, looking at 2019, um, showed that in 2019, we had economic losses of 232 billion, but only 71 billion were insured. So that gives us a scale in terms of the gaps that we are seeing in terms of insurance, um, insurance protection. And particularly, that figure becomes even more amplified when we look at especially um, vulnerable countries and developing markets. And this is significant because obviously, I think that if we can step back a bit and look at what is the role of insurance within our economies, Right? What is the role of insurance? I think we, we have to recognize that it's a role, there's a role that it can play in terms of building household resilience, um, supporting the resilience of businesses and enterprise development, and also mark, capital market development. But if you have the majority of our populations not having access to these tools, access to these kinds of solutions, then we are also dealing with um, significant problems in a context where we expect climate change to increase the vulnerabilities. And so for me, this takes us to the final point or the final recommendation, which is um, providing international support to mitigate and manage climate-related sovereign risk. Um, and again, referencing the point that Sam had raised earlier, the need for more collaboration, coordination between different institutions and actors within this space um, to really drive the kinds of solutions that are needed at the coalitions. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen or the lessons that we've seen from COVID is that um, we need innovation in terms of uh, the, the, the needed financial instruments. We have to look beyond debt, <laughs> um, given the questions that we have around the sustainability of what we are currently faced with. Uh, and one of the principal things that we have been working on within the IDF is to try to foster the kinds of solutions that can begin to engage around these issues. Um, and last year, we launched a program with the United Nations Development Program who does, which does a lot of work in terms of engaging governments around their national adaptation plans to say, how can we begin to work with you to mainstream greater thinking around um, risk management within and, and harnessing the capacities within the insurance industry to strengthen government capabilities to deal with the kinds of risks that we are seeing on the horizon and even contending with today. And for us, this is quite important because it is ultimately about strengthening public financial management, ultimately to the benefit of citizens. Um, and so I think that this report has been a timely, or it is a timely contribution to our conversation uh, because it really highlights the challenges and the complexity and the magnitude of the problem that we are faced, but importantly, the need for us to collaborate more effectively. Uh, so again, I will just close by saying congratulations to you and the team, and I really hope that we can take this report even further um, in really, um, you know, taking the recommendations that you have made into real action um, with many of the governments who are really um, seeking the kinds of solutions that you have articulated within the report. So thank you, Uli and team. Thank you so much. And indeed, I mean, we would be more than happy to continue uh, work on this. And, and um, uh, in fact, wh when I hand over to Emily, uh, who is uh, working with her team very hard on, on improving the data situation and all these issues, um, we have already discussed, well, we probably need a, a phase two report because um, there is so much need for, for deeper analysis. And um, so we, we've been trying to kind of frame the issues in this report, but um, it was also very clear, especially when we did the empirical analysis for the 10 countries of Southeast Asia, that the data situation is still very poor. So there needs to be um, a lot of effort in, in improving data. And, but but uh, importantly, the, the analytical capacities, because data and, and analytical capacities are very much 
relate it. Um, let me hand over to Emily, who's been uh, part of the team, and, and great to, to see you. And Emily, you are still muted. Here, no, no. yes, here's the unmute button. <laughs> I found it. Um, thanks so much, Julian, uh, and hello, everybody. Um, my name is Emily Mazakirati. I'm the founder and CEO of 427. 427 is a Moody's affiliate. I have to start with a disclaimer here that I am not speaking on behalf of Moody's Investors Service, the uh, credit ratings agency, and uh, nothing that I said should be heard or construed as a, as a rating comment. Um, the work that we do as 427 is that of being focused on modeling the physical impact of climate change, and this is um, how we contribute to this report and the, the capacity in which we contribute to uh, Moody's more generally. Um, so, really, thanks for this report. It was really an honor to be a contributor. I, I want to um, highlight for the audience here what a tour de force uh, from Uli and, and John and the other authors this report is and uh, the extent of the detailed extensive analysis. I really invite you to uh, look at the detailed finding. So this was a great uh, prop for my comments about data and also uh, what well, was noted by uh, Ms. Iahan just before, the connection between the micro and the macro and, and the importance of risk assessments and understanding um, the vectors between those very local uh, asset specific or location specific or uh, industry specific impacts and how they then uh, transfer and transmit into a type of more macroeconomic impacts. Um, so I'll focus here on this is a research project that's intended to um, serve as a learning opportunity for the community. So what have we learned with regard to how we can model and quantify those impacts? What can we derive? What else is left in terms of research? And, and there is plenty, uh, even though I do want to start by saying um, the, the, the things where we've made progress. So I'll start by saying we understand the mechanisms. I think this report does a really fantastic job of um, synthesizing and emphasizing the uh, different um, transmission mechanisms, uh, and, and we presented them early in the presentation, but they range from the fiscal impact um, of climate-related disasters, the impact on the uh, ecosystem and natural economy, macroeconomic impacts, uh, impacts on trade, impacts on political stability. There's really a wide range of mechanisms, and those echo and capture what a number of contributors have found over the years, including uh, generally the credit rating agencies and the way they incorporate those trends and those shocks and how they look at how this drives really um, the economic impact. The other good news is, is we do have better data, if not all the data, to understand the exposure efficiently and at a very granular level. And so when trying to understand the physical impacts of climate change. There's really two main things that one need is understanding what is going on at the local level in terms of the assets that's being studied, or it could be a city, it could be a local population, it could be an agricultural area, it could be real estate or manufacturing property. And then understanding what are the projections for um, climate change and, and the effects of climate change for that location. And, the first part is a big part of the challenge, and that's a challenge that every financial institution experiences in every country of the world. We have the same thing in the US, in the EU, in Japan, where um, banks are really challenged and struggling to extract out of their systems or uh, gather information from their portfolios, from their uh, clients and partners on where assets are located. And that's a really key first point is where is the asset? Second point is, is there any mitigant at the local level? And that's a completely different level of complexity to gather this information. But these are the uh, data challenges that we still have where we have made a lot of progress is in the ability to process climate data at scale and really look at a wide range at loca of location um, and understand systemically what the, what the impacts from climate change are. And of course, um, global climate data is about to 
uh, go through significant upgrade with the release of a new set of models. This data has started being released already for uh, for modelers and scientists, and so. We're, we're in a position to understand at least what the exposure is. And so there are some, um, I think, good examples in the report of how this very local granular data can be used to understand the macroeconomic impact. Um, one of the case studies that we developed was looking at the exposure of the Philippines transportation infrastructure to floods. And so you start seeing at um, which airport and port um, might have exposure to sea level rise. And as you see, I'm afraid, the, the quite system, uh, systematic exposure of a lot of those transportation infrastructure in, uh, in, Indonesia, in the Philippines, you uh, can really start surmising what are the impacts in terms of the economy, local impact, of course, but the impact, the ability of the Philippines to uh, contribute to supply chain, to import, export, um, Etc. Uh, similarly, if you look at the impact on manufacturing facilities, we did a, a study on a, on a slice of the economy. We looked at the exposure of corporate manufacturing sites held, owned, or operated by large traded companies. And we found that in Vietnam, um, all facilities are exposed to a high level of heat stress. Um, about a quarter or a third of them have high exposure to floods, um, of half of them have exposure to cyclones. And so any of those hazards can create either a shock and get some of those facilities offline or can create long-term losses to productivity and impact both at the firm level and at the macroeconomic level. Um, and this analysis holds as you continue to expand and look at a range of hazards and a range of countries. So looking at the, the region as a whole, we found that um, over 40% of manufacturing sites in the region had high exposure to water stress. And if you exclude Thailand and Vietnam from this analysis, it's really much closer to uh, over half or, or two thirds of the facilities. Um, what does that mean? It means sometimes you're gonna have manufacturing facilities that can't run um, just because the water isn't available for them to run. Of course, there's also implications on local population and competing uses for water like agriculture. So all of these are ways that we can start understanding how different sectors in the economy can be more or less affected by what type of hazards. The same examples continue if you start looking at impacts on agricultural areas, impacts on urban areas, real estate property, think of mortgage portfolios for banks uh, on small and medium enterprise um, borrowers, again, for financial institutions, et cetera. So, the good news is when banks have the information or when governments have detailed information on where the, the specific underlying assets are, there's now data that can be used to make this analysis at scale. There's also ways to shortcut using satellite imagery where we're able to look at um, excess exposure in highly populated areas, in areas with agriculture. Um, the part that remains very much a work in progress is how do you convert this type of detailed exposure analysis to understanding the size of the effect from an economic and financial sector standpoint. And this is very much a work in progress. This is hopefully something that we can continue to work on um, over time with Uli. This is work that we're doing with Moody's as well on um, what are the impacts at the macroeconomic level. And so we are um, currently working to retrofit some macroeconomic models to really incorporate some of those long-term impacts over long-term projections and looking at impacts in terms of uh, GDP and employment, inflation, et cetera. And then looking from a, from a bottom-up perspective as well on what are the impacts on issuer level probability of default. So what are we learning? What have we learned? And, and what do we expect to see when this type of shocks or long-term chronic impact hit certain corporations or uh, hit certain sectors of the economy? What does that mean in terms of credit risk and how does that start affecting um, financial institutions? And so the challenge for um, the, the, the supervisors and the regulators and the governments is 
um, this need to have both this uh, very global view of everything that can be affected by climate change in a country, but also having a sufficiently detailed view to understand where are the main um, vectors of vulnerability in terms of regions, in terms of industries, so that their intervention can be really targeted. My, uh, my last point here, my conclusion is, uh, I think one of the striking conclusions of the report and the analysis um, performed by John as well is um, that investing in adaptation and resilience really pays off. And it pays off not only by virtue of uh, helping prevent impacts and make the economy more resilient, but also because of the signal that it sends to investors um, that the country, that the government is taking adaptation and resilience seriously. And so it avoids this double penalty that we have a risk of seeing on the market. Um, good risk management calls for diversifying away from vulnerable assets. And so avoiding this double whammy and avoiding an increase in the cost of capital by showing that the country is investing in its own future. I'll turn it back over to you, Only. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Emily. And uh, uh, indeed, there, there are a lot of data challenges awaiting us, and, and uh, but we really need to, to have better data to um, uh, dig much deeper. Um, let me uh, hand over to Nick. Nick, you've been working a lot with central banks and supervisors and the NGFS secretariat. What, 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 what's your take on uh, the importance of macrofinancial risk for? sovereign risk and, and what central banks and supervisors should be doing. Well, thanks, Oli, and thanks to the team for this fantastic piece uh, of work. It really is a, a major step forward, I think, in terms of understanding um, sovereign risk. I'd just like to make a, a few comments. First, just to put the, the, the research in the context of the work of, of INSPIRE, the International Network for Sustainable Finance Policy Inserts, Insights Research and Exchange, Inspire, um, which was uh, delighted to be able to co-fund uh, this piece of, of work. Then I just want to look at the findings uh, of, of the research, um, some of the implications, draw out some of those, and then look at the, what, what next. And I'll come to your question as I, I run through that. So, so as you suggested at the beginning, uh, Uli, uh, Inspire is a research stakeholder of the Network for Greening the Financial System, uh, which has grown substantially and has um, central banks, financial supervisors from all parts of the world, including in the ASEAN region as part of its network. Uh, Inspire has uh, now 26 research projects uh, in, very, in a whole range of different aspects of the challenge of greening the financial system as it relates to central banks and supervisors. Sovereign bonds, sovereign risk is one of the six research themes and it's really fantastic to see uh, this work coming out. We've actually got other work uh, in, in a similar field. So this, is, this will be uh, followed by a number of other research projects looking also at different dimensions of uh, sovereign bonds, uh, credit risk, relationship with um, SDGs. Just as a plug, if I may, uh, our fourth call for research proposals is now out uh, with a deadline of the 31st of October. So again, thanks very much for, for the research. Just on the findings, I think as other uh, commentators have already said before me, I think this is a very useful, rigorous piece of work. I think the transition mechanisms really help in understanding the relationship between uh, climate uh, disruption and different aspects of the, uh, the sovereign risk uh, challenge. I think it confirms that sovereign risk is a, is a systemic uh, issue. And particularly if we think about then the extension to sovereign bonds, that this is a systemic asset class um, setting the price for other assets in the, the economy. And so very important. The chart you showed and John, you, you went through in terms of the, the, the differential implications of vulnerability and resilience for different categories of country from advanced so-called uh, through to highly vulnerable, I think really, really sort of typified and, and depicted that sort of sovereign climate risk spread um, and, and with the very sort of raw implications, which I will now sort of maybe draw out a little bit. Clearly, those countries who are facing the greatest uh, divergence in terms of their, the, the, the credit, um, credit risk and, and the yields they will pay are already the most vulnerable. Um, obviously have contributed least to the problem of climate change and have least capacity to uh, respond. So there is a, a, a real concern, obviously, that, uh, that this 
the, these uh, pricing differentials will become crystallized in, in market prices, impacting access and cost of capital for those countries which actually need to raise the most capital. So we have a real uh, urgent uh, um, problem potentially. Um, and therefore we want to uh, think about actually how we avoid perverse outcomes, those perverse outcomes where actually those countries uh, which need to raise the most capital for their de de development uh, needs and to respond to climate change could be facing increased cost and reduced access uh, to capital. Um, in, uh, in the US, uh, in the past, we've had the practice whereby of, of redlining where certain districts were excluded from access to capital by banks because of their income stateness. And, and there's a concern, I think, potentially that in the global economy, we could have a phenomenon of greenlining where certain uh, countries or regions could actually face um, reduced access to capital or for uh, climate risk uh, reasons. I think this is why we do need an integrated response, a purely market-based response, will not, respond, will not actually respond to that, that challenge of the crystallization of risk and the increase in cost and the reduce, uh, a reduction in, in access. So I think the, the, the framework you set out, Oli and team, in terms of needing that systemic response is, is very important. So if I can turn then to the, the what next and your recommendations. Firstly, if I may take the sort of first two recommendations you set out, the vulnerability assessment and then the importance of climate risk in public financial management. Just a commentary um, on, on that. One of the things obviously that uh, many of us are familiar with and, and a major step forward is the, the task force for climate related uh, financial disclosures, which is really increasing um, the, the transparency in the corporate sector vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, capital markets and also driving forward action, which is obviously what we want to see. One of the things we don't have at the moment is a similar TCFD for sovereign bonds. Um, and, and I think there are some discussions in a number of quarters about that. But for me, the, the, the report's findings and your analysis suggested that a, a structured way in, where, which, way in which uh, countries as issuers um, could communicate with their sovereign investors um, would be very, very useful, particularly to make sure that this was an efficient process. Um, in another part of the world, not in the ASEAN region, many of you will uh, have seen the, the work that has been engaged by uh, sovereign investors under the investor policy dialogue for deforestation in Brazil, which has led to, I think, a very mature discussion between sovereign investors and a, a country, an issuer, major economy such as Brazil, about why those, those, uh, those investors uh, see deforestation as a systemic risk, and importantly, why they want to be continued to be invested in that country, and they don't want uh, to see rising risk. So I think the first thing maybe then is there is there a uh, efficient disclosure for a, for sovereigns um, which could be communicated to investors. The, your third recommendation, which is about uh, central banks uh, and supervisors, this is clearly very relevant for the macro prudential work um, that uh, central banks do in terms of systemic risk. Clearly, this is moving forward a lot. We have now uh, the first round of scenarios for climate change stress testing uh, from the NGFS, and I think the, the detailed uh, granular analysis you've done here will really help on that. And if I could just pick up one of the comments uh, you, did, you did make in your presentation and in the recommendations, is this question about the prudential uh, treatment of, of sovereign bonds. Um, and, and as we know, the sovereign bonds are given a, a, a risk-free treatment um, and, and we may need to reflect on that and the way in which uh, particular uh, sovereign bonds are treated, particularly in insurance portfolios or pension uh, portfolios in light of um, climate risk. Your fourth recommendation is, is, is obviously importantly focusing on scaling up investment and I think all the, the analysis in this report um, highlights in the, the need for this investment to be preventive and to happen uh, now, that we need this investment to actually prevent uh, the crystallization of both real economy risks and then the financial system uh, uh, consequences of that. Um, there is some reference in, in, in the report about uh, sovereign bonds particularly, 
But I think there's a very interesting line of inquiry to, to think about how uh, countries where they have the uh, fiscal capacity could issue dedicated sovereign bonds, which would build up resilience to transition and fiscal risks. And I think for investors in those countries, that could be seen as an important way of actually ensuring that the climate risk they may face in their core sovereign bond portfolio would be offset with these uh, resilience bonds. And then your final recommendations, essentially about international financial cooperation and the role of, of, of IFI. It's fantastic to see the ADBI uh, involved in this. I think, again, we need to highlight the urgency of, of this, highlight the, I think, increasing consensus at a policy level about the need for a sustainable recovery, but the need really to translate that into very practical mechanisms which actually enable uh, capital to flow where it's needed most. And um, the Southeast Asian region is obviously one of those particular uh, regions. So maybe to close, if I may, just to cite another uh, piece of, of work coming out recently from the ADB, in fact, uh, Green Finance Strategies for Post-COVID Economic Recoveries in Southeast Asia, I think highlights a number of tools, uh, risk mitigation tools and so on, which uh, development banks such as the ADB can provide to scale up this, this finance, particularly uh, in the context of COVID uh, recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, you, you've already now uh, given the perfect um, um, uh, translation to the next speaker, uh, who is sitting in Manila and um, uh, working at the ADB on exactly these issues. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot, Nick, and uh, I hand over to Ahmed and looking forward to your, view, uh, your views. Uh, thank you, uh, Uli, but uh, thank you also, Nick, for that uh, very smooth handoff. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, very grateful to that. But of course, also uh, grateful to you, Uli, uh, and, and the others who uh, I have the privilege of joining uh, and sharing this platform with today. Um, you know, Uli, I remember uh, when we met uh, in Manila last year when you came uh, to join for a meeting of the ADBI's advisory board, and I was, I was struck then by something that uh, is elaborated in this document, um, but, but just, and this is something that Nick alluded to as well, um, but just, you know, the perverse nature of, of the costs and risks associated with this, this set of uh, of problems that that those who contributed the least, um, who suffer the most, uh, are also pay the biggest price, both in uh, in sort of NPV terms today, in terms of uh, impact on on sovereign risk, but also the largest price over time. And and that's a that's an unfortunate uh, circumstance, um, but one that that I think is brought to light and and made clear by by the work you've done. Um, I wanted to thank you uh, very much for this, uh, I think, really amazing piece of work. Um, it, it does two things which I think are really absolutely critical uh, to, to moving this agenda forward. Um, the first, of course, is that it's, it's analytically very robust. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, in particular, you know, things like drawing the clear links between various elements of, of, uh, of the chain of causality and events. Um, and sort of backing that up um, analytically, but then also making, you know, a number of very specific suggestions about how the whole entire ecosystem of actors um, who are engaged in this work uh, can move forward. Um, obviously, development uh, banks, development finance institutions, I think are important um, elements of that program. Uh, and, you know, the, the recommendations, I think, uh, are important for us in that they really do call upon us to act with the full range of our capabilities. You know, both our programmatic engagement um, with countries, our policy advice, um, our, our risk mitigation tools. Um, but I think very, very importantly, um, you know, what may be a bit of an underutilized superpower of development finance institutions, which is their ability to leverage institutional legitimacy, convening authority, um, policy expertise um, in order to set standards. Um, and, and that's hard work, the work of setting standards. It, it has to rest on analytically rigorous uh, frameworks and it requires uh, the collaboration and uh, engagement of a very broad and diverse variety of actors. Um, but there are times when it's extraordinarily important and this is, this is clearly one of them. Um, I'm just gonna, as I think the other commentators did, um, perhaps just comment on, on a few of, of the recommendations. 
Um, and then I actually thought there were some interesting comments made by those who went before me. So I'll just briefly perhaps react to a couple of the things they heard. Um, the first thing I do, I thought I would do is, is talk about where we're already engaged. And, and two of your recommendations um, represent areas where uh, the ADB and, and other institutions like it, like the World Bank, I think have already been act active. These are your recommendations that um, uh, different actors implement policies to scale up investment in climate adaptation and resilience and, and help develop insurance solutions. And of course, the very direct reference to us, your recommendation that, uh, that international financial institutions have a role in supporting climate vulnerability and in helping countries address climate related risk. Um, we of course have been engaged in these in a number of different ways uh, from technical assistance to surveillance and risk monitoring and, and, and incorporating things into our programs. Um, just very, very briefly, uh, sort of the range of that activity um, there's been a fair amount of work, uh, as you will know, on, on disaster risk reduction. Um, for example, um, in, in a variety of different urban settings, uh, we've been looking very closely at how to integrate climate change and disaster risk considerations into things like land use management, something I think we've done quite effectively both in Da Nang and Vietnam, as well as here in the Philippines. Um, you know, one thing that we've been doing for a while, but uh, I think is increasingly important and coming to the fore in the context of COVID, of course, is helping uh, recovery and building back better um, post-disaster. This is something that does precede COVID. Uh, for example, um, in Indonesia, after the 2018 tsunami in, in, in Palu, uh, we were very engaged in helping design build back better projects um, that resulted in more climate resilience uh, infrastructure and societies. Um, you know, going forward in this space, there will be more and more focus, I think, from us and perhaps from others on uh, driving forward the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment. Um, those, I think, also advance the broader agenda that we're talking about. Um, but then, of course, there's a number of other things. I won't go into them in any great detail, but, but uh, work on local currency bond markets, on disaster risk financing, on new forms of insurance, um, including things like con contingent disaster financing instruments, um, for our member countries. Um, all of these, I think, represent areas of, of existing engagement. Um, now, moving forward to areas where I think we can, some recommendations that, that jumped out at me um, that I think that we could do more on, um, and we will, you know, we will take this work forward with us uh, and to see how we can do more in these areas. Um, you know, the recommendation that uh, we encourage countries to develop comprehensive vulnerability assessment plans um, and in particular, the recommendation uh, that countries set up national climate risk boards. Um, this is something that makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, and I think we're gonna need to spend some time internally to see how we can advance this agenda. Um, you know, the devil is in the details. Uh, I think that um, the, we, we still do need additional tools, methodological tools to ensure that uh, if we are going to move towards um, incorporating estimates of, of these long-term costs, um, that we do so properly. Um, and I think there's, there's more work to be done there. Um, in terms of the recommendation that uh, we, that countries mainstream climate risk analysis into public financial management, um, this is an area where we have been acting active, but of course there's more uh, we can do to do, there's more we can do here. Um, we had already instituted a climate risk screening and climate risk assessment process for our own portfolio uh, almost six years ago. Uh, and we're in the process of preparing a climate assessment framework uh, that should help decision ma makers evaluate low carbon and resilience building uh, recovery investments um, based on value for money, life cycle cost benefit analysis, uh, and risk analysis. Um, there is a really interesting point here, which I think demands deeper thinking, um, but is, is extraordinarily important um, in the recommend in the in the report about. Um, you know, trying to encourage a move away from vulnerable sectors. Um, you know, obviously one way to do this uh, is to, you know, force private actors to internalize, you know, otherwise externalized costs, i.e. through things like uh, carbon pricing. Um, but in contexts where that is impossible, um, perhaps there are other things that governments could be doing uh, to think about proactively supporting other sectors. Um, certainly there's, there's a history uh, in this region of, of of some success in, in elements of that, of that process, although there are also risks, of course. Um, maybe I can then just move on to some reactions to things I heard. I thought there was a number of interesting comments uh, made by, by uh, some, of the, some of the people who spoke before me. 
Um, uh, Dr. Ofther made a point about uh, the, the ongoing presence of uh, cooperative arrangements, but, but the you know, ones that don't necessarily represent uh, the voice uh, from the region. And I couldn't agree with her more on the importance of both regional and sub-regional uh, fora um, uh, to engage these issues and advance this agenda. And I think that may be something that, that we, could, uh, we could bring into our work, uh, for example, in, in places like GMS and other regional fora where the ADB is involved and that, of course, Dr. Butler is extremely familiar with from her time here. Um, there is an important point made uh, by, by more than one person about um, the fiscal cost of uh, adaptation and mitigation. And on that, um, you know, I would only note that uh, the analytical chapter uh, released today in the IMF's latest uh, World Economic Outlook um, noted that uh, the goal of bringing net carbon emissions to zero by 2050 in each country can be achieved through a comprehensive policy package that is growth friendly, especially in the short term. Um, if this is true, then it would mean that not only um, it would mean that we don't necessarily confront this stark trade-off uh, between climate responsibility and growth, something which, of course, is important in any context, but becomes even more important uh, in the context of these strained fiscal capacity uh, in a COVID and then hopefully ultimately post uh, post COVID world. Um, I thought, uh, Emily, I thought, thank you for your really interesting remarks. I, I thought I would just note just. Uh, how extraordinarily important I think the role of rating agencies will be uh, in this process. Um, I think potentially as important as the actions of any other actor in terms of uh, forcing the recognition um, of costs. Um, I think rating agencies have an important role to play. Um, and this, Nick, you know, it was a really interesting comment you made about the risk of, of what you called greenlining um, and, and the associated point you made about the risks that we crystallize, uh, you know, differences in spreads. Um, you know, as with, you know, redlining, which preceded greenlining, you know, this sort of crystallization is something that we also already see. Um, you know, for example, in the differences paid between by single B African borrowers and non-African single B African uh, borrowers, um, there are clearly persistent differences in risk perception that are difficult to trace back um, to economic fundamentals that those can pose significant costs and it's important that they not um, become uh, you know, crystallized reference points for markets. Um, so I thought that was a very important point. Um, you know, a last point I would add is that we focused on sovereign risk, but of course sovereign risk sets the benchmark for corporate risk. Um, and as, as difficult uh, as uh, the situation is for sovereign balance sheets in emerging and frontier markets, it's even more strained um, for corporate balance sheets. Um, and so uh, that, I think, remains also an important area that deserves uh, ongoing consideration, obviously reflected, I think, in some of the recommendations, such as those about stress testing banks. Um, but, but I think it's also a broader point about the entire corporate sector, and certainly the corporate sector that has hard currency um, liabilities. Um, and I guess just in closing, what I wanted to say was that um, I was asked uh, some time ago, uh, and, and the topic has come up more than once, uh, does the COVID-19 pandemic make climate action more likely or less likely? And of course, one could argue that it has resulted in such enormous economic cost and, and, and in a world that is clearly poorer than it was two years ago. And so in that sense, it makes it harder. Uh, one could also argue that um, you know, our recognition um, that uh, these sorts of crises and threats that we view as somewhat theoretical that they can quickly become real and that they can be extraordinarily painful, perhaps this will be a call to action. Um, my only uh, sort of response to that to say is that it remains to be seen um, and the choice is really up to us. Um, but that work like this, um, very clear, rigorous, defensible, analytically complete, um, very clear recommendations, um, this type of work makes it much more likely. Um, that in response to COVID, uh, we will take actions to deal with this other very important set of risks uh, to the global economy and to global welfare. And so again, I want to say thank you to those who put this work together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ahmed, for, for again, very insightful comments. And let me just um, flag that we actually, you highlighted that uh, climate vulnerability and the cost of sovereign capital, that this is also then translating uh, to the corporate sector. And um, 
uh, we've actually done some related work where we could show exactly that, where we could see, show that uh, um, with large uh, uh, firm level data set that uh, uh, corporations in climate vulnerable countries do indeed have to pay also uh, a climate vulnerability uh, premium and uh, that this is also um, increasing problems of access to finance. And of course, uh, holding back uh, businesses means holding back development. Uh, and so this is really a big problem. And, um, and I very much uh, uh, like the, the point that you highlighted about uh, climate policies being actually pro-development and pro-growth policies. And um, I think uh, what we are highlighting in our report are all these macro financial risks and if not addressed, they will um, uh, in, in, in many countries lead to really a vicious spiral where um, high climate vulnerability worsens the, the uh, worsens sovereign risk, worsens cost of capital in the public and private sector. And really then we have this, this downward spiral uh, because there is no fiscal space uh, uh, on the public side for, for crucial investment in adaptation. Also the private sector uh, is not able to, to invest and climate proof its businesses. And then things are really going downhill. And what we need is uh, to turn this around, to, to see more investment in resilience, uh, which will then uh, feed into a, a virtuous uh, cycle uh, where we have um, uh, uh, kind of build greater resilience, reduce climate vulnerability, and also help to bring down the cost of capital. And uh, so it was in this spirit that we put forward the, this kind of rather comprehensive uh, set of uh, packages. But, but I think it was uh, great that you, you uh, teased that out. And um, thank you so much. And let me now hand over to uh, Mark from the World Bank. And uh, behind the scenes, we had some some technical issues in between, but I'm uh, uh, even more delighted now to see him actually. Um, and uh, Mark, uh, let me hand over to you. And great to have you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ori. Uh, and and um, thanks for the opportunity to be on what is actually, a, a, to me, a very interesting uh, panel. Um, uh, the report also, congratulations on that to the team. It's, a, it's an impressive undertaking. It's an ambitious report. Um, just to let you know, Ulrich, that uh, although we had some technical issues, I have actually been in the meeting the whole time. It was just I wasn't in as a speaker, so that's why the uh, the, the camera wasn't on and so forth. But I have been able to hear everything that's been said. Um, I'm going to do three things very quickly. Um, I'll outline um, a little bit some of the work that we're doing at the World Bank, um, which I think is complementary in some ways to some of the things that have been discussed uh, today. Uh, second, I will make a couple of methodological remarks about the empirical chapter of the study, um, which I hope will have some broader applicability for this kind of work um, going forward. Um, and third, I, I, I will give a flavor of what I, where I think that the margins on which um, particularly the multilaterals can contribute um, uh, in, in future on this area. And if there's a punchline to what I'm going to say is that I think that the data problems that we have in this area are very much tied with the policy problem. And um, I think there's, a, there's a, a need for better data to drive better policy. Um, that, that's sort of uh, my kind of theme on, on this topic. But first, let me talk about some things that we're doing. Um, and I'm gonna list four things that the World Bank is doing. First, um, we're doing some research on uh, sovereign ESG scores from private data providers. So we look at seven prominent commercial data providers and uh, I think some of the things we find there very much parallel to some of the messages in the report. Um, in particular, um, sovereign ESG scores um, from private providers, they're very correlated among themselves, not surprisingly, and they're also very correlated with just the wealth, just the country's level of, of per capita uh, GDP or, or, or development more broadly. Uh, and, and the corollary of that is that there's a danger uh, in using the, the, these data sources that we actually exacerbate the problem of less finance going to uh, countries which are climate vulnerable. Um, 
just a, an example, JP Morgan's um, ESG um, dollar denominated uh, EM bond index um, gives something like 10, order of magnitude 10% boost in weight to, um, to high income countries. So you can see immediately if you, if you start following these things mechanically, uh, you're not going to um, get the kinds of results that you would like. Um, uh, a related point there is that there's actually less consensus in, in the ESG space about what constitutes good environmental policy. And I'll, I'll come back to this point, but the, the correlations in that area across the providers um, are much lower. They're about 0.4 compared to higher than 0.8 for the, for the overall scores. Um, related to that, um, second uh, thing that the World Bank is engaged in is, is trying to provide better ESG sovereign data. Um, in 2019, we launched the Sovereign ESG Data Portal, and it organizes uh, data and definitions um, that in many cases, those private data providers were already relying on, um, but improves the interface, the, access, the accessibility, the, the, the guidance on the available indicators. I think this is important. I think it's a step forward. Um, there are many problems uh, still. Um, for example, there are, there are a lot, on a lot of these variables, there are long data lags uh, and, and infrequent reporting, which, which um, obviously reduces uh, the, the value. Um, but we are, um, we are also working on the margin of trying to innovate and provide higher frequency data. Uh, for, for example, satellite data um, that's, that's uh, yeah, for example, uh, store parking lots uh, for retail data that has the potential to increase the frequency um, and the accuracy of, of, of data that's used for ESG purposes. Um, the third thing we do is, is work directly with um, countries, obviously. Um, we have a sovereign ESG engagement guide and um, in particular we work with debt management offices uh, to try to present their own national data um, more clearly uh, and in ways that, 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 that help um, investors um, channel their, their resources uh, in, in the right directions. And again, I'll, I'll come back to that kind of idea at the end. Um, and then lastly, just uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what my own department does in the World Bank, which is our, our own credit risk ratings. Uh, obviously, we have to think about how to bring climate factors into those, um, those um, ratings. Uh, we've long been, I think, at the forefront of trying to um, define some of these things. Um, you're probably all aware of the bank's uh, CPIA, the Country Policy and Institutional Assessment, which contains um, uh, staff-driven um, uh, assessment of countries, um, um, among other things, of environmental policies and institutions, which are trying to draw on the the capillarity that the, the, that the World Bank has in all, all of our borrowing countries. Um, and environmental factors, you know, do come in to our risk ratings. You can think of easy examples, most obviously in small island states, for example, where disaster risk really is a big, uh, a big factor in, in, in the credit risk um, measures that we, uh, that, that we come up with. Um, so, um, uh, as part of this work, I think increasingly I see us undertaking primary research of the kind that this paper, um, that this, that this uh, ADBI SOAS paper um, has, has also provided. We've done our own work on the relationships between policy and institutional variables, uh, such as the ones we're talking about, and bond yields, um, rating agency credit ratings, our own ratings and probabilities of default. Um, so that's sort of an overview of, of some of the things the bank is doing, and you see a big emphasis there on data. This brings me to uh, the work presented today, uh, and in, in particular the empirical chapter. Um, and and I, I uh, just would like to just take a bit of a closer look at the results in the paper. I, I, I'm not quite sure I'm fully convinced um, by all of the findings. Um, the paper makes use of uh, a data set which is provided by um, Notre Dame University um, here in the US. Um, and the, uh, the measure of vulnerability contains variables such as, and I'll just read out a few, but projected change of cereal yields, 
water dependency ratio, projected change of deaths from climate-induced diseases, projected change in marine biodiversity, um, hydro capacity. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't see a very clear line of sight between those variables, particularly uh, as stated in the paper, measured at a quarterly frequency, and the likely uh, magnitude of effect on um, bond spreads that the report um, finds. Um, there's, there's, I still have some questions because I went in and looked at the Notre Dame data set and uh, you see quite a large um, variability in, in their variables. Just to give you an example, Indonesia, the, 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 the overall uh, gain measure rose from 42 to 47 between 1995 and 2015. That's a change of five. So if you multiply that kind of variability by the coefficients in the, in the paper, you get implausibly large effects on bond yields. I suspect that there's less variation in the, in the variables um, that the paper uses. I looked at the, the charts on page 87, and it, I don't quite understand actually uh, how those variables relate to what I see in the Notre Dame data. So there's probably a, a, an interesting conversation to be had about what are the, not, not just the statistical significance of those coefficients, but what are the economic um, magnitudes of the, of the effect? Because uh, if I'm right, then I suspect that they're implausibly large, but maybe the authors have, a, have, have, have something else to say on that. Um, I do suspect, though, that the storyline really is that there's, there's a, a, a correlation between these spreads over time uh, and what's been happening on the, uh, on the climate variable over time. And you see that in some of the charts that are, that are contained there on page 87. Um, in our own work, uh, to give you an idea, we, we um, we see the likely spread impact of concerted policy reform measures in a country. This goes beyond climate, um, but what could you know, reasonably be assumed as, as, as a policy reform package over, let's say, two or three years, we see a magnitude in the order of something around 60 basis points, so much lower than, than, than I think this, 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 this implies. Um, but you know, I, I think that the real the real lesson really from that would be that it's something we still don't know, and it's plausible uh, that that climate vulnerability does affect uh, country variation across country variation of, of costs of finance. I, I buy that as a hypothesis. I just don't think we have through high frequency ver uh, data variation uh, a way of identifying that 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 effect. Um, uh, so looking ahead, I think that. Um, uh, if you try and take from where I started to where I am now in my comments, I think any ESG methodology needs to balance the priority of measuring things properly and pricing ESG risks, which is important for financial sustainability, as the report talks about, but not inadvertently worsening funding gaps. Um, you know, there's a growing pool of, of climate ready financing out there in the private sector. Investors are eager to channel resources towards, um, towards ESG. But the key is, and this goes back to the data point and the, and the empirical point, the key is measuring within country policy improvement over time, not simply variation across countries. Um, in the World Bank, we've shied away from too much sort of uh, publication of our own uh, of our own measures of, 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 of policy quality. There's a risk that we'd be seen as, as naming and shaming countries, but but I think that increasingly there's a role for um, uh, us to provide more data, in particular at measuring that within country variation across time, hopefully improvement, and and thereby trying to channel some of that enormous pool of resources that are out there in the private sector looking or uh, ESG branded investments and willing to accept, in fact, lower yields if, um, if, uh, if the resources are, are, are mobilized to uh, focus on uh, climate adaptation and, and mitigation. So I think that's the margin where the multilaterals can really contribute. We're working on this with Fiona and, and her team. Uh, I, I think that we have a long way to go. I'll stop there, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, uh, you, you raised a couple of very uh, relevant points, and and I mean, just uh, I'd like to 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 say that the your starting point that uh, the data problem is very directly related to the uh, 
policy action or non-action, I think that is really a key point. And, um, and I think that's also why we're saying the first thing we need, kind of if we look at an action package, is what we highlight as policy recommendation one. So kind of let's have a systematic assessment of all these different macro financial vulnerabilities, because in most countries, this hasn't really happened. And also, I mean, uh, one reason why it hasn't happened is also that the, the data uh, availability is, is often very poor. But as you say, you know, the one is, is related to the other. And uh, when countries, when governments start getting serious, for example, by, by establishing um, uh, a national climate risk board uh, and, and really systematically uh, use all branches of government, including uh, central bank supervisors to, to kind of to get the data and the, the brain power together to, to, to analyze that, I think then, then much is already gained. Um, the points you, you make about the, the um, uh, you know, measuring climate vulnerability and climate resilience, um, I fully agree. I mean, this is, or this continues to be a challenging area. I mean, we've been uh, doing work on this for, for quite some while and, and we, we, we have been, I mean, in 2009, uh, 2018, we did work uh, with the UN, UN where we uh, used the ND gain uh, kind of as it was more or less, but, but we, we've kind of um, uh, made sure to, to uh, become more selective in, in kind of what uh, subcategories are included and so on. Uh, I would certainly not pretend that we have the perfect measure of climate vulnerability. And you're right, you know, kind of some of the data are a bit like, hmm. But I would say, by and large, kind of this story makes a lot of sense. And if I speak with policymakers, um, I mean, they basically confirm the, the kind of the storyline. Uh, now, um, whether, I mean, I, I, would, I would not take the, the uh, point estimates, you know, too literal. I mean, uh, you know, whether, uh, you know, it's 200 or whatever basis points. I, for me, it's more kind of the, 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 the general um, message uh, that we can take from this kind of analysis. And um, hopefully we will be in a position to, to use better uh, data. But for the time being, we just have to use whatever we have. And, and uh, so in that sense, I'm, I'm confident that, uh, you know, we're doing uh, what we can, but of course we will continue uh, to to uh, try to to dig deeper. Um, now, I must say the uh, uh, time time plan for for the uh, panel discussion didn't work out quite as I was planning. Uh, we have eight minutes left, um, which basically now gives me the possibility to allocate exactly one minute to each of uh, uh, the speakers. Um, and I would myself have a lot of comments and, and questions now to you, but, but um, uh, I would just like now to move <laughs> without having had the, the uh, you know, general discussion, uh, move to the closing round. And um, I would like to, to go in the same order as before. Um, so, um, and, and please everyone, just one quick comment no more than one minute, because otherwise we're cut off. Uh, so uh, please, uh, Shamshat, could you start? And if everyone could please turn on their video, uh, not least so that we can have a nice family picture. Okay. So thank you, Uli. I think uh, I will not uh, take too much time, barring that I think we should continue to work in this area together. <laughs> and uh, to say that, uh, it's really action that matters. And I think we should really try to have more advocacy of bringing the finance and the central banks together as a minimum. Because without that, we are not going to be able to get good action. Rest of the points that have been raised, um, I'm with everybody, so I'm not going to deliberate too much on it. That's my last take. Thank you. Equacy, please. Yes, thank you, Uli. Um, also to say, I think the, the interventions have revealed 
I think a very rich level of insights from different perspectives, which I think is only positive in terms of taking this work forward. Uh, my intervention would be from the IDF's perspective, we see this as an important body of work. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's very much aligned to a lot of the things that we have been advocating in terms of what we see in our engagement with government, but also the recommendations in terms of tangible actions. Um, and so for us, our interest is how can we work with those regional institutions to really begin to bear what we see as some of the things that the insurance industry can lend to supporting uh, the, the policy recommendations. And we are open and uh, supportive of the proposal to foster greater collaboration and coordination diff amongst different partners on this. Uh, so that would really be my closing um, intervention. And thank you to all for their efforts. Thank you, Ikwesi, and I think internet, more cooperation is certainly needed. Emily, please. Thanks. Um, I'll focus my last uh, statement on the, on the point that was raised by Mark and just discussed right now about what is the right data to understand the size of the impact, both in terms of risk and in terms of resilience. And I think when it comes to resilience, we haven't quite found the right metrics yet, and that is something that we have to be able to measure well if we want to show the value of investment and resilience uh, finance um, on, on risk um, and sovereign risk, generally speaking. Um, I will flag a couple of uh, research efforts that we have underway looking at both trying to quantify macroeconomic impact of climate related events, looking, histor looking at historical um, data, historical weather uh, impacts and how that has affected uh, economic growth and performance as well as measuring the impact of sovereign risk on, uh, on PDs working with uh, maybe EDS models. So um, there will be more research and I'm very much looking forward to uh, continuing this conversation on a number of, um, of topics. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Nick, please. Yes, I mean, I think the main thing which this, this study has uh, shown is confirmed in my mind that we need to accompany prudential sort of risk-based assessments of climate change with very clear promotional measures. And we should not allow sort of climate risk analysis to actually um, reduce uh, access to capital or pricing of capital for developing countries who need the most. So I, I think having this meeting in the context of the, the annual annual meetings of IMF and World Bank is very appropriate because this needs to be brought in front of finance ministers to really think about that positive agenda. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Amit, over to you. Uh, thank you. Maybe just a very, very quick comment um, that I would echo um, the importance of, you know, cooperation and engagement of, of multiple actors, but also, uh, you know, sort of uh, agree that, that uh, driving collaborative work ultimately, you know, does depend on sort of robust and defensible uh, conclusions. And so I think the ongoing research agenda remains extraordinarily important. Um, but in closing, again, I want to express my thanks uh, to those who did this work and and to those who had the opportunity to participate in this panel with tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, Mark. Um, thanks, Ori. Um, I guess the, the flavor I would add to what I said earlier would be I, uh, to, to pick up on, um, I think it was Ahmed in his remarks about the fact that the, the green agenda can be a growth agenda. Um, I strongly believe that, um, but for that to happen, um, you know, we need to find ways to um, encourage um, the right kinds of investment. Um, and for that, I think uh, private capital mobilization is the key. Um, you know, I've, I've been working in, in, in the World Bank for 20 years and I've grown, you know, highly conscious of the fact that we have very limited firepower. Um, and you know what the money that we can bring to the table is is really a fraction of both what's needed and what the private sector can provide and so um, I think what's what the, the interesting challenge is 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 how we give the private sector the tools to identify the right places to make that green agenda a growth agenda thank you Mark John do you want to come in Yes, I'd just like to thank everybody for the comments today, particularly um, Mark on the last um, comments about the empirical analysis. 
as Uli mentioned, um, you know, we've attempted to use a refined measure of the ND gain index to somehow address the issue that you, you mentioned that the, the original index tends to throw in a lot of different things into the, into the measure itself. So we've stripped out um, many measures that are correlated with the economic variables to, to deal with endogeneity with the economic cycle. Um, and yeah, there are other issues around the, the magnitude of the estimates. Um, as Oli mentioned, of course, we're not saying that these are the exact uh, coefficient sizes, but the, the story is, is intuitive and um, we're reasonably confident in the results in terms of um, the controls that we have in place. Yeah, so these, all of these points are well taken and uh, I thank the comments in particular and everybody else as well. So that's all I would say. Thank you. David, uh, you, you gave the opening remark, so, so you have now the last, almost last word. I will have the last one. Thanks, thanks, Oli. I'll, I'll let you have the last word. But I do want to thank the panel and all the participants. You know, we've been talking about climate, and we've just come through the UNGA Biodiversity Summit and the Leaders Pledge that WWF and others have put together. Just want to remind everyone that we're also facing this uh, this dire situation with respect to collapse of natural systems and, and uh, an environmental crisis that's very highly correlated, of course, with the climate concerns. So we need to take advantage of these market forces uh, within the context of the COVID crisis and its response that many speakers have alluded to. And hopefully we can, we can use those forces to help steer countries in the direction of greening the COVID response. We see the institutions as well responding. WWF's involved with trying to form up on the model of the TCFD, a task force on nature-related financial risk disclosures. And so I think these two sides of the same coin need to be emphasized going forward. Perhaps it's the subject for the next report. Really, thanks. Thank you, David, and thanks everyone. Uh, this was really uh, a wonderful uh, discussion and I really wish, I mean, we, we already scheduled two hours and I thought we were generous, but, but uh, it clearly shows that there is so much uh, to discuss with this topic and, and uh, this is certainly not the end of the discussion. I mean, we hope that the report will contribute to furthering the discussion. Uh, I hope that all of you will, will take some of the policy messages forward in your respective areas of work. And uh, I very much look forward to continuing working with all of you and thank you so much and uh, uh, stay safe. Bye-bye.